So good afternoon. I think it's time to begin the session. So our next speaker will be Dr. Doug Smith, um, who will give us the Australian um, experience of translating to the clinic. So thank you, Doug. Well, first, firstly, thank you um, to Jason and Clemens uh, for setting the scene here on this theme. Um, so I won't be rehashing any of uh, Jason's uh, excellent introduction into the how-tos of translational research. Um, and I'll just be focusing on the Australian uh, legal framework. And uh, as Jason alluded to, it is a bit of a, a dry topic. Um, lots of uh, amazing research being presented in our conference, but um, yeah, this one, not so exciting. All right, so I'll just, in one slide, um, to set the, the scene as, you know, what are we doing? And I guess um, we're hearing over the last few years this uh, drive towards a personalised or precision type uh, medicine approach. And for radiopharmaceuticals, this really means uh, having available to the physician uh, a toolbox of many different uh, diagnostic and therapeutic products so that the patient's management can be tailored for their disease type. And in Jason's first presentation that was on Friday, he presented an excellent slide where you know, from one solid tumour, there was like nine genetic profiles that were uh, able to be elucidated from just that one tumour. So that kind of information may be able to be generated through uh, imaging technology if there are particular agents that are available to probe these kinds of uh, genetic signatures or uh, biological signatures. Uh, so I guess what this pyramid is supposed to show is I guess we're going to have a few products that are abundantly available and, and uh, easily accessible. We're going to have, uh, and, and that'll include obviously products like FDG, there will be common products where uh, centres of excellence in your city might have um, available to, to supply uh, products that are listed in the pharmacopoeias. And then there's this, uh, potent if we're going to, uh, I guess, reach the, the potential of this personalised medicine approach, we're going to have to have this enormous number of niche products that are, are going to answer those clinical questions of, you know, what is going on at the molecular level in these particular um, disease states. I've done it again. Okay, so that's, that's the why we're going to end up with a lot of this um, need for translating these new discoveries into generating that wealth of niche products that are available to, to answer the questions. So onto the Australian legislative framework, there's essentially two primary documents, the Therapeutic Goods uh, Act and the, the regulations, and they were drafted to provide for the establishment and maintenance of a national system of controls to ensure the quality, safety, efficacy, and timely availability of therapeutic goods. And I, I highlighted that, and I'll get back to that in a moment. And this also set up uh, the, the national regulator in Australia, the Therapeutic Goods Administration. The two parts of the Act that I'd like to focus on uh, that are relevant to our discussion is uh, part 3.2 of the Act, which uh, has the title Registration and Listing of Therapeutic Goods and uh, Part 3.3 of the Act, the Manufacturing of Therapeutic Goods. And it clearly states that medicines must be approved and entered into the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods before they can be supplied unless specifically exempted under the legislation. And similarly for Part 3.3, uh, medicines must be manufactured by persons licensed to manufacture at licensed premises unless an exemption applies under the legislation. So I've highlighted this, uh, this mysterious exemption part, and uh, I believe the purpose of that exemption is possibly related to the other part that I've highlighted there, the timely availability, which seems like the odd one out there. But um, as the, I guess, physicians know, that timely availabil availability could be listed as uh, just as critical for that particular patient as quality, safety and efficacy. There's no point having a, a great product if it's too late for that product uh, for that patient. So what are these exemptions? I'll, I'll run through them. Uh, the first uh, series of exemptions that I'll, I'll talk about are really uh, the ones that are utilised by public hospitals to administer products to their patients. 
Okay, so that part of the Act that requires products to be entered into the ARTG, that they've got to be registered approved products, there are exemptions to that, and this is an excerpt from Schedule 5 uh, to the, in the regulations that provide these two particular uh, exemptions that are relevant to our discussions today. So I've obviously missed out all the other ones that are not relevant. Um, so item number six talks about medicines other than medicines used for gene therapy that are dispensed or extemporaneously compounded for a particular person for therapeutic application to that person. And item 13 specifically relates to radiopharmaceutical cold kits uh, that are containers of sterile reagents to which radioisotope is added immediately before injection into patients and manufactured by a radiochemist or a radiopharmacist in a public or private hospital for subsequent extemporaneous compounding and dispensing for use by or in connection with a patient of that hospital or a patient of another public or private hospital in that same state or territory. Okay, so um, with that exemption that relates, or those re uh, exemptions, they relate to the requirement to have a registered product. So now, uh, sorry, if I go back, we can have um, medicines that are extemporaneously compounded or, uh, or more specifically, radiopharmaceutical cold kits, which may be stored and, and utilised in a compounding procedure at a later time. Uh, these are now exempt products. Uh, that, that, where they can be made exempt products. In combination with that, excerpts from uh, Schedule 8, which provide exemptions to Part 3.3 of the Act, the requirement for products to be manufactured under a TGA licence, uh, there are the following uh, persons who are exempt to have uh, a TGA licence to manufacture. And this is where things start to get a little bit grey in how one interprets these particular exemptions. So medical practitioners, dentists and other healthcare workers registered under a law or state or territory uh, have uh, the uh, ability to manufacture a medicine uh, by a medical practitioner or a dentist specifically for a patient under his or her care and similarly a healthcare worker for um, a therapeutic device. Pharmacists uh, enjoy um, uh, the ability to manufacture a therapeutic good other than biologicals, um, and then there's some specific ex uh, conditions there. And then thirdly, biomedical engineers, radiochemists and pharmacists in public hospitals, um, they can manufacture therapeutic goods other than biologicals by a person when employed by a public hospital or a public institution and produced by that person for supply in hospitals or public institutions in the same state or territory. Okay, so there's a few things to, to work through here. And this is where it is a bit interesting and a little bit gray. It specifically says that a medicine may be manufactured by a medical practitioner or a dentist for a patient under his or her care. Does that mean they physically have to manufacture the medicine or can they manufacture the medicine uh, by delegating it to someone under their authority? Do they need to sign off on the medicine? Um, these are the words in black and white that are in the, the legislation, but uh, there seems to be some grey area there as to what that medicinal, uh, sorry, that exemption uh, means in terms of nuclear medicine practice. Can, can a doctor ask someone in, in the clinic to prepare a medicine under his or her authority, and that that would be uh, utilising the medicinal, sorry, the medical practitioner's exemption here. Uh, similarly, down in uh, th uh, item three, uh, pharmacists have a very clear uh, professional definition, and they are registered with a pharmacy board, and. Um, that that's very obvious uh, what they are professionally. But what is meant by a radiochemist and what is meant by a biomedical engineer is not so nailed down. Uh, a radiochemist uh, could be defined as someone with a chemistry degree who works with the radiation, but there's no legal definition here. Um, and so 
that has a little bit of grey associated with it, and that exemption appears in Australia at the moment to be enjoyed by um, various uh, qualified individuals. Oh, and there was also the, uh, the other grey area of uh, other than biological, so can one radio label a antibody or not? It, it, does that fall under the biologicals uh, category? Um, so could you, uh, does this exemption only allow the radio labelling of say smaller molecules or non-biological molecules? That, that appears grey as well, especially when you consider microdosing, is that, is that uh, uh, does that sort of exempt the antibodies from falling under that biological category? Okay, so just in a simple case study, one could, as, as a, a nuclear medicine department, uh, look to the legislation and say, we wish to start uh, administering lutetium PSMA 617 to our patients within our care, and they can legally do so by applying, uh, they must apply two exemptions, one to part 3.2 of the Act, one to part 3.3 of the Act, and, and schedule five, item six, you could apply that one, extemporaneous compounding, and then uh, to part 3.3 of the Act, you could have in your team a radiochemist or a radiopharmacist or a biomedical, biomedical engineer, and, uh, and then you would be covered by those two uh, uh, exemptions to legally administer this product to patients in your department. Notice that this doesn't require that the department have any data, have any clinical trial. Um, they simply can decide, based on those two exemptions, to go ahead and start administering to patients this product. <clears throat> All right, um, I'll now move on to another series of uh, exemptions. This one applies uh, specifically to uh, manufacturers who have a licence. So I've highlighted that in bold. So this is a, an exemption that applies to the um, therapeutic goods other than goods referred to in item three, but that relates to clinical trial use, uh, or biologicals that are manufactured by a person under a contract between the person and a public and pri or private hospital. Secondly, in accordance with the formulation specified by the public or private hospital uh, for use with in connection with a patient of the public or private hospital. And so this is a, an exemption that can exist between uh, a manufacturing facility that has got a TGA licence, is uh, authorised to manufacture or a step in the manufacture of the goods at those premises and engage directly with the nuclear medicine department and supply that product. Uh, so this is an example, I think. Uh, FDG uh, doesn't need to necessarily be a, a product entered into the ARTG, the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods, uh, if this following exemption was applied where uh, part 3.2 of the Act requires that products be uh, registered, but um, the FDG could be made under this contract manufacturing arrangement between the hospital and the, uh, the manufacturer who's licensed to manufacture. Uh, this slide's probably a little bit out of place. I, I should probably put it after I talk about um, uh, clinical trials, but uh, Nevertheless, there's a, another exemption that applies to Part 3.3 of the Act. So again, this is relating to the requirement to uh, be manufactured under GMP at a TJ licence premises. And so it, this exemption is allowing uh, goods prepared for the initial experimental studies in human volunteers to be made outside of GMP. Uh, the, uh, the regulations allow access to unapproved goods under various schemes. Uh, one, use in clinical trials, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, for personal importation, um, I don't think that's relevant to radiopharmaceuticals. I don't think I'll be able to call up Jason and ask him to send over the good stuff for me and I'll self-administer at home. Um, so that one doesn't really apply. I won't talk about that. Uh, special access scheme, there's two categories and I'll, I'll run through that and uh, authorised prescribers. 
Oh, and just the note at the bottom there that uh, these exemptions, these schemes that the TJ have set up, they apply to part 3.2 of the Act, and that's the requirement for the product to be uh, a registered approved good. So part 3.3 of the Act still applies uh, relating to the licensing of the manufacturer, unless an exemption applies. <laughs> okay, so uh, here's a relevant one that, that may be of interest to our community. Uh, Schedule 5A, uh, item 3, therapeutic goods used solely for experimental purposes in humans. And there's a lot of dot points here. Um, so I'll just quickly run through those. Essentially, uh, the, uh, the sponsor needs to notify the TGA through the, the CTN form. So this is the, the clinical trials notification scheme. Uh, and then you've got to obviously pay the fee. So unlike what Jason uh, highlighted there, the FDA is intimately involved in clinical trials. In Australia, uh, the, the clinical trial only needs to be, uh, or the, the TGA, the regulator, only needs to be notified of the, the clinical trial. And the primary responsibilities now fall to the Human Research Ethics Committee and, uh, and also to the sponsor and to the, the uh, primary uh, investigator of the trial. So the, the actual regulations specify that the trial must be approved by the sponsor of the goods and the sponsor of the trial, having regard for the advice of the, the HREC and uh, which reviewed the protocol and is assuming responsibility for the monitoring of the trial. The terms of approval of the sponsor or the body or organisation conducting the trial for the sponsor must be no less restrictive than the terms advised by the HREC. Uh, the TGA must not uh, have become aware uh, that to start or continue the trial is not in the public interest or have directed that the trial not start or be stopped. The sponsor has not received advice from the HREC that is inconsistent with continuation of the trial. And the conditions set out in Regulation 12 AD must be complied with. And this basically means the use of the therapeutic goods must be in accordance with uh, good clinical practice, the protocol approved by the HREC, and uh, in accordance with the, the National Statement on Ethical Conduct in, in uh, Human Research. The trial must cease if, if the ethics committee inform the PI that the use is inconsistent with the protocol that they have approved or any other condition for which approval was given. Oh, OK. Yep. Uh, so there are a couple other mechanisms. Authorised prescriber, a doctor can get um, uh, approval to administer non-approved goods. The special access scheme exists, which uh, again exists to enable access of uh, non-approved goods that may be approved overseas. Um, and uh, essentially category A is for the, uh, the seriously ill um, and B is for all other patients that don't fit the category A condition. Uh, essentially, I'll just leave you with a couple of recommendations. I think nuclear medicine departments should document their processes for the legal uh, basis for supply of unapproved uh, therapeutic goods to patients within their unit. And uh, if, if in house extemporaneous uh, preparation of products is performed, then uh, GRP should be followed and there's some great um, documents available through uh, PICS and through the European Pharmacopoeia. Uh, this is our team um, and what you can't see on the back of my shirt is uh, the following. <laughs> and uh, thank you. So in the, in the interest of time, we'll move on. But I did want to point out that there is 10 minutes at the end of the session. So Jason, you didn't get off the hook. So there will be a chance for you all to ask more questions at the end. Thank you, Dr. Smith.